So I filmed this video and I had to split it into two parts. So the first part is going to be act one and two and then the second part is act three and four simply because there's so much to say. Let's dive straight in! If music be the good of love play on, give me excess of it that surfacing the appetite may sicken and so die. Arsino starts to play with this remark that if it is true that music fuels love, then he begs the musicians to play on because of course he wants to stop loving, he wants to stop the pain of unrequited love. Love is making him restless he's unable to calm so full of shapes his fancy that it alone is highly uh, high fantastical so love is such a vivid experience that nothing can compare to it which is why it is all the more painful for him that he doesn't really have love in his life and so he wants the music to replace it so that he can end the suffering we of course as the reader know that it's because of Olivia one of his friends then asks him if he would like to go hunting deer because I mean stop wallowing and like let's go do something and the duke says that actually I am the dear myself so as soon as he saw Olivia she made everything good she purged the air of pestilence and now his only problems are his desires that like fell and cruel hounds ever since pursue me so this is actually a reference to Diana and Acteon their story in mythology Acteon saw Diana bathing and the goddess didn't want anyone to like witness her so she turned him into a deer and then his own hounds chased him down because he was out hunting Olivia is using the duke's feelings as a weapon against him because well she doesn't love him so his own feelings are against him because now he has to go through that suffering. Valentine comes back with news that he has asked Olivia's handmaids once again whether the Duke could have audience with Olivia but she refuses because Olivia is still in mourning and she refuses to go out of the house for seven more years. We see that love truly sees no faults because uh, the Duke sees it as a positive trait and instead says she's she has a heart of that fine frame and so likewise I mean if she really loved her father and her brother that much that probably means she loved him that much as well so she's loyal so I don't care if she doesn't go out for seven years and then he goes out into the garden because love thoughts lie rich when canopied with flowers. So basically he wants to daydream about her and the flowers. So already in this first scene it's it's a comedy, it's very much light-hearted, he's a little bit made a fool out of and how much he like twists everything to the positive light. The next scene focuses on Viola who has just come to Illyria after a ship crash and she's desperately quizzing the sailors on where she is and where her brother is and she thinks he's in Elysium so that means that he's in heaven because he drowned or at least she thinks that he has drowned but the captain tells her that her brother is strong and that the captain himself saw uh, her brother clinging to a mast so if he if he did continue clinging then he probably survived and Viola thanks him for giving her hope and also asks about Duke Orsino who is a noble duke in nature as a name so then we find out more about the duke that he's still a bachelor that he's in love with Olivia who's a virtuous maid the daughter of a count so Olivia's father and brother recently died and that is why she probably won't let Viola work for her so Viola begs the captain to disguise her because he seems like a fair and outward character and she trusts him so she decides that she's going to be a eunuch and uh, serve the duke in disguise as a man because he will accept her as a man and not as a woman given that it would probably be inappropriate for him to do so and so she can sing and speak to him in many sorts of music. The captain obeys and he leads her to get changed. This scene starts with Sir Toby Belch, Olivia's uncle who doesn't understand why Olivia is reacting so badly to her to her brother's death. For his part, Sir Toby is always happy because he's drinking his troubles away essentially and he can afford to do it. Maria, the housekeeper, begs him to stop coming in this like this late because Olivia doesn't like his parting and Sir Toby says that he doesn't really care about propriety and decency, he just wants to have fun with Sir Andrew. Uh, to which Maria replies that well Sir Andrew Agicic is like such a fool but Toby defends him saying that he's as tall as any other man, he has 3,000 dukas, he plays the violin, he speaks three or four languages but Maria says he's, he's a natural fool, he isn't brave, he's very argumentative and it's shown that in the scene although it may seem that Toby doesn't really care about Olivia. He, it's just his personality as a whole that he's a little bit irresponsible and he's into drinking but we see that he really does care about her because he wants to find her the best suitors. That's why he's spending all this time with Sir Andrew. He he like he treats him as a friend. He wants uh, he wants him to have a good relationship with Olivia and he also defends his friend against Maria who's quite 
like sharp-witted and I think we already begin to see the chemistry between Maria and Sir Andrew even though he's off the scene this is a very prominent theme in Shakespeare's plays that there's like a maid and like another side character that fall in love Sir Andrew comes in and because Toby just heard Maria basically talk smack about Andrew he tries to tell her to accost her or to chat her up and what follows is a very com comedic scene because of course Will's Night is a comedy where um, Andrew tries to flirt with Maria but she's not having any of it and Maria is this very quick-witted and clever young woman and it's honestly a pleasure to to hear those barbs because they're very smart and my favorite part was when she said that when she made a joke and Andrew didn't understand it and she said that oh it was merely a dry chest and then he asked her if she's full of dry chest to which she replied yes and then she let go of his hand and she's like yeah but that was the biggest gist of all so in other words she calls him a big joke and then she leaves and Andrew is like, oh my god, a woman never said that to me before. And so the two of them sit down for yet another drink. And that's a, at that point, they begin to talk about Olivia and how Andrew doesn't think he stands a chance against the Duke. But to that, Toby says that she will not match above her degree, neither in estate, years, nor wit. So basically what she's saying is that she doesn't want to marry anyone who's wealthier, older, or smarter. And the two then decide to hold a party and they go off laughing together. That's a very prominent recurring theme throughout the play that they decide to go to have a party and they just leave. And honestly, they're like the... If it helps you remember, they're like the two fun uncles at a party who are definitely irresponsible and you probably wouldn't trust them to have a small child around them. But nevertheless, they're the life and entertainment of the party. Valentine tells Cesario, Cesario of course being Viola, that he's likely to be wealthy soon because already the Duke treats him like no stranger. When the Duke enters, he looks straight away for Cesario because he knows no less but all. So already he trusts Cesario, already he has told him or Viola everything and he asks uh, Viola or Cesario, I'm just gonna say Cesario, to please stand at her doors and tell them there, they, there thy fixed foot shall grow till thou have audience. Basically go stand there and say that you will leave, leap all civil bounds rather than make unprofited return, go beyond all social pr propriety, be loud, do something. Unfold the passion of my love, surprise her with discourse of my dear faith. Basically, he's asking Viola to be the wingman and tell Olivia how much she loves him, tell tell her about how great the Duke is, try to convince her to get an audience because it would have been seen as like inappropriate for the Duke to get the audience himself. It would be beneath his status. It would be like the other, the other men would make fun of him for chasing after the girl, especially if she rejected his audience. So that's why he's sending the servants, uh, servants like across. And also it would be customary that the servants would communicate with other servants. And it's, it's like, it's indirect because it's more much more about the process of courting a woman and like fostering those relationships rather than being more direct and forward and when Cesario asks why he's the one doing it of all people because the Duke has thousands of servants the Duke replies Diana's lip is not more smooth and dubious thy small pipe is as the maiden's organ shrill and sound and all is assemblative a woman's part so what Duke Orsino was saying here is that Cesario doesn't have a mustache and his voice sounds like a woman's voice which is why he thinks he's better suited to talking to Olivia because she needs a more feminine hand. If Cesario will do this, the Duke promises that thou shalt love as freely as thy lord to call his fortunes thine. So the Duke is desperate for Olivia's affections and of course the irony here is that he wants a woman and that's exactly what he's getting in the form of a man uh, as Viola dresses up as Cesario. He, Cesario replies that he'll do his best but aside Viola murmurs that she wishes that she was his wife not Olivia because she's already in love with him. The famous Shakespearean love triangle. This scene starts with Maria confronting the fool about him coming in late. Maria again just was the fool. Honestly, she's one of my favorite characters in this. She's very quick-witted and although some of her pranks are, I think, quite mean, she she does like really cut to the point and I think that she's 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 a very understanding maid who knows perfectly what Olivia does. She manages her position well. She's just a very capable woman. But okay, so she confronts the fool about him being late. So again, she takes uh, serious care of her responsibilities to which the fool says, don't worry, I'll get out of it. At that point, Olivia walks in and she asks him why he's late and that he better make it good because otherwise she's kicking him out. So fools were, of course, during the time used for entertainment, the court jester, the court fool, 
they're kind of doing like a stand-up comedy routine for the wealthy and that's what they were hired to do they would have those like funny costumes they'd be famous for jibing at people the fool quickly thinks on his feet and asks why are you grieving? Olivia plays along, says, well, because my brother is dead, even though, of course, the fool already knows that. He tells her, well, he's in hell, right? And she says, no, he's in heaven. And then he says, well, that's why you don't need to grieve anymore. And so Olivia finds that pretty amusing, but Malvolio, her assistant, doesn't. And Olivia is quick to say, if he wasn't so arrogant, he was instead generous, guiltless, and of free disposition, is to take those things for bird balls that you deem cannon bullets. So a jester isn't really criticizing people in an evil way, but he is making fun of them. Whereas a wise, wise people don't make fun of people, even if they do criticize them. So that was Olivia's take on that and at that point the fool commends her and Maria announces that there's a fair young man and well attended talking to Sir Toby and waiting an audience with Olivia. Olivia asks Malvolio to send him away and then drunk Sir Toby comes in, he's really drunk or plagued by lethargy as Olivia diplomatically states. She sends the fool away to take care of her uncle and at that point Malvolio comes back in. As soon as the characters leave, another character come in. So it's never boring and especially for comedic effect, it ensures that there's a lively pace. So if you're writing about the writer's craft, I would make sure to mention those jests in passing even though they aren't really critical to the plot but to be fair the plot is essentially that it's a comedy so those interactions between Maria, between the fool and Olivia, between Malvolio, they're small moments but they're really what gives this play that extra bit of like sparkle and uh, Malvolio tells her that the man has an answer for everything and he won't be sent away and that he says he'll stand at your door like a sheriff's post and be the supporter to a bench but he'll speak with you. So at that point, Olivia finds out that he's young and well-favored, and of course that catches her fancy. So it's not one of those ugly servants that the Duke is sending, it's a handsome young man who's this mysterious suitor. She says to show him in and she calls for Maria, and Cesario asks to see Olivia, and Olivia replies that she will answer for her. To which Cesario says, no, please let me see Olivia, the most radiant, exquisite, and unmatchable beauty. I have spent a long time memorizing this beautiful poetic speech just for Olivia. Olivia tells him to get to the point, thus of course revealing her identity. Uh, we again see that Viola is just as smart, so she knows perfectly well not only just what other women won't want, but how to lure it out, how to best play her game. And Olivia tells him to get to the point. If you have reason, be brief. It is not the time of moon with me to make one, and so skipping a dialogue. So in other words, she's not happy. At that point, Cesario tells Olivia that he has a message from the very depths of the Duke's heart. Yeah, Olivia's not having that either. I've heard it all before. What hearts I've heard it all before. Viola gets everyone to leave then. And alone with Olivia, she asks to see her face not covered by the veil and then praises it as this beauty truly blend whose red and white nature's own sweet and cunning hand laid on. And she says that it would be a shame if you leave the world no copy. So in other words, she basically gets Olivia alone and she says to her that you're so attractive, it would be a shame if you didn't have children. And Olivia jokes that, well, she could always do an inventory and leave behind like one mouth, two eyes, whatever. But Viola doesn't give up and she says that she came here to talk about the Duke's love that has adorations fertile tears with grown that thunder love with sighs of fire. In other words, he's desperate for you. Again, Olivia is just not having any of it and says that although the Duke is virtuous and noble, of great estate, of fresh and stainless youth, in voices well divulged, free, learned, and reliant, and in dimension and the shape of nature, a gracious person, but yet I cannot love him. And at that point, Viola replies that if she were the Duke at this point, she would not accept that. Olivia is of course curious, like what would you do? And she's already enamored by this young man who really has an answer for everything and who's been flattering her since the moment that he came in and so she asks and uh, Viola replies that she would build a wooden cabin next to Olivia's gate and sing love sonnets for her until the whole town hears and until she pities her. You should not rest between the elements of air and earth but you should pity me. And Olivia replies to that that you might do much 
So she's obviously impressed, but she still manages to say, like, don't come back, I won't love him. Unless, unless, of course, you come back to tell him to tell me news of how the Duke reacted. So already she's luring Cesario back in. She won't say it outright, but she wants him back. She wants to have another meeting with him. She then offers Viola money, but Viola's a proud woman, and Cesario is, of course, a proud servant. And he says that love makes his heart a flint that you shall love and let your fervor like my masters be placed in contempt. Farewell, fair cruelty. So in other words, you cruel woman, I hope you experience that for yourself. And at this point, it's hard to know whether that was a strategic move on Viola's part to kind of the care and stick treatment to lure Olivia back in, or if that was genuinely an expression of pity because she loves the Duke. I think it's up to you to decide, but for me, I think it was a mix of both. Olivia, for her own part, asked herself, even so quickly may one catch the plague. Methinks I feel this youth perfections with an invisible and subtle stealth to creep in at mine eyes. Already she's enamored, but ironically Viola's words come true because she loves a man that just won't love her back because that man doesn't exist. She then tells Malvolio to run and give um, Cesario a ring that he has left uh, back to him. And she remarks that fate shows thy force, ourselves we do not owe, what is decreed must be and be this so. So she really doesn't know what she's doing. She understands that it's perhaps foolish to chase a messenger. She doesn't really know where he's from, but he's this mysterious guy. He's handsome, he's young. She thinks that by his speech he's well-mannered and even if she recognizes how foolish this is, she wants to see that clever young man again. And so that's why she sends Malvolio off. Antonio and Sebastian are talking. Yeah, that's another feature of Shakespeare's plays. We often get a lot of characters that it could be hard to keep track of. But I think in Twelfth Night, they're pretty straightforward. We have like the Duke's troops and we have Olivia's troops. By troops, uh, perhaps it isn't the the correct word to use but essentially the people that accompany them and yeah we also have sebastian who is viola's brother and he tells antonio his friend that my determinate voyage is mere extravagance he'll go wandering he doesn't know where leave me alone it's enough for you to know that my name is sebastian but i'm gonna use rodrigo he had a twin sister born at the same time viola of course for some hour before you took me from the breach of the sea was my sister john so Viola also thought that Sebastian had drowned. We see the parallels, another feature of Shakespeare's plays, how there's like often parallels between one character and the other, and that also makes for comedy because it's a sen like a sense of repetition. He says that his sister bore a mind that envy could not but call fair. So his sister was an incredibly beautiful and smart woman, and we as the reader, or the viewer, if you're watching this, because I think it's important to not forget that the play is meant to be performed, uh, to, well, we have seen evidence of that for ourselves with Viola's genius planning and genius scheming. And Antonio really admires Sebastian and he decides to go with him to Duke Arsino's court, even though he has many enemies in Arsino's court. Cut to Malvolio speaking to Viola, so he chases after and gives him back the ring and Malvolio for uh, so Cesario says that she took the ring off me. So Viola is very quick to realize that already Olivia might, must be crushing on her, that she's giving a ring that well, she knows and he knows that they didn't leave back. So in a way, Olivia is being vulnerable and opening up about her feelings for the messenger. I mean, this is the equivalent of basically saying I love you during the times. I mean, this is equivalent to dropping the handkerchief. It's very obvious that it's saying like, come back, I want to see you again. And Malvolio doesn't believe that Olivia would have taken the ring just to change her mind so quickly. So he throws it down on the floor and leaves. Uh, as soon as he walks away, she realizes she made good view of me, indeed so much that she's me thought her eyes had lost her tongue. In other words, the disguise stole Olivia's heart, and but but Viola can't even blame her because how easy it is for the proper faults in women's vaccine hearts to set their forms. So in other words, women easily fall in love, so of course Viola was easily seduced. Uh, they easily fall for good-looking but deceitful people, and now she loves the duke and the duke loves olivia and olivia loves viola what thriftless sights shall poor olivia breathe she hopes time will fix this because it's far too complicated for even her genius mind to interfere and somehow make this better this scene is with our favorite uncles toby and andrew who are drunk and singing and then the fool comes in and they pay him to sing with them and i think for an audience of shakespeare says this would have been very amusing because they also like to spend their time at the pubs and drinking so this is sort of like that 
oh, this is just like us relatable moment. The Fool sings a love song and there's another jazz that I would like to draw attention to which I thought was pretty good. Uh, so the song is called Hold Thy Peace or in modern language, shut up, like let me speak. And the Fool says that he can't start singing because the first line starts with shut up. So he would have to shut up. But yeah, um, after that, Maria comes in and scolds them. You guys are so loudy. Like, please stop. You're going to wake the house up. It's indecent. And then then they ignore her and at that point Malvolio comes in and says that have you no wit manners nor honesty but to gabble like thinkers at this time of night is there no time no respective place persons nor time in you to which Toby replies I do have a sense of time I can keep in line with the music and before this we have also heard the make fun of Malvolio so he is not a popular figure in the play and he honestly tells them that they need to fix the behavior because they're embarrassing Olivia and she might kick them out of the house to which Toby tells Malvolio that dost thou think because thou art virtuous there shall be no more cakes and ale just because you're annoying and stuck up doesn't mean that we shouldn't get to have our fun he calls for Maria to bring to bring more wine and Malvolio leaves and Sir Andrew says because both of them are furious that this random guy, this random servant who's beneath our position, is telling Olivia's uncles what to do. Uh, Sir Andrew says that it would be great if they could have a duel together and he would love to make a fool out of Malvolio. And at that point Toby says, oh I'd love to write that letter. So they're kind of like joking and talking around about what they could do. But they are also semi-serious because it's rash drunken behavior. But luckily Maria puts a stop to this in a way because she says that she'll do it and that Toby shouldn't act out because he's very important for Olivia. The men ask her for gossip about Malvolio and she tells him he's a pure somewhat of a puritan and affectioned as that con state without book and utters it by great swords he's very stuck up and proud and on that vice in him will my revenge find notable cause to work so what she's planning to do is she plans to write a letter that looks like Olivia's handwriting addressed to Malvolio in which she will make him think that Olivia is in love with him. Malvolio, because he's such a stuck-up guy and he's so egotistical and obsessed with him, with himself, he'll believe it and he'll embarrass himself because he'll be acting all high and mighty just to find out she doesn't like him. So Andrew and Toby praise her genius and then they go off to bed satisfied that she will accomplish it. The Duke is listening to a romantic song again and he asks Cesario what he thinks to which Viola replies it gives a very echo to the seat where love is thrown. So in other words what a wonderful song it does indeed remind you of someone that you love. Hint, hint. The Duke then asks, have you ever loved someone because you're young? And Viola says, oh yes I have. And the woman was of your complexion. <laughs> so again, situational irony of course, because the man she loves is sitting right in front of her. And then the Duke says that uh, if the woman Cesario likes is like the Duke, she's not worth it because if she's old as him, then she's definitely too old. Uh, women are as roses whose fair flower being once displayed does fall that very very hour. So it's implied that he's a little bit obsessed with appearance and he thinks that as soon as like the woman starts to age, she's not as attractive anymore. The fool enters and she, he sings a song about love. The Duke pays him. Then he sends everyone out and once again he addresses Cesario. He sends him to tell Olivia that his love for her is more noble than the world. Prizes not quantity of dirty lands. In other words, he's telling her that this isn't about the money. <laughs> this is not about the money. This is not about the fortunes. I love Olivia and I won't take no for an answer. Viola tells him that he should take no for an answer. Important conversation about consent. But also she tells him that because she of course thinks like, that's me, that's me. There are other women who might love you. Me. So that's the sort of conversation we're having. And uh, Arsino dismisses her saying that no woman's heart's so big to hold so much. Women's love is temporary and shallow. His love is as hungry as the sea and can digest as much. In other words, don't make the comparison because my love is bigger than women. Uh, there's no way I can just not love Olivia. They are as true of heart as we is Viola's defense because she, of course, as a woman understands that a woman can love just as deeply by her own example of how much she loves the Duke. She then makes up a story about a metaphorical sister, though she pretends to be Sebastian essentially, uh, who had a daughter who liked a man so much but she never told him and she kept her concealment like a worm in the bud feed on her damask 
cheek. In other words, she turned ugly. But then she quickly changes the topic because it's getting into dangerous territory. The Duke dismisses it too, saying to give Olivia a pretty jewel. So he's trying to buy her, he's trying to bribe her, and uh, Olivia runs off. Toby and Andrew urge a friend named Fabian along and they hide behind Box Tree and, that Mal and they see Maria who tells them that Malvolio has been practicing his behavior for 30 minutes. The letter will make a contemplative idiot of him. Malvolio enters and he's so thoughtful and he says, oh, this letter looks like Olivia wrote it. It's the way that she crosses her T's and oh, I mean, I'm sure that of course she loves me because I mean, I'm me and Maria said that if she loved someone, it would be someone who looked like me and uh, oh, it's not unheard of. Servants fell in love with their masters. Their masters fell in love with servants. Malvolio goes imagining how wonderful it would feel if Olivia loves him because of course she's of a higher status than him. He's already imagining the jewels and how he could finally talk to Sir Toby and tell him everything that he thinks. Toby and Andrew are of course furious and laughing at the same time because they don't like that Malvolio is speaking terribly of them. Malvolio says that he would like to tell Andrew that oh like stop drinking so much and your friend is not really worth it and the, he then sees the initials like M-O and like Malvolio and he thinks it's his name and at the end of the letter we have the famous line it says that Malvolio shouldn't be scared of Olivia's affections because some are born great some achieve greatness and some have greatness thrust upon them so yeah in case you didn't know where that famous Shakespeare quote was from it's actually from a fake letter in a comedy in Twelfth Night and I love that for Shakespeare because the Bard was truly the king of comedy and tragedies and generally universality. The letter tells him to argue with servants and think about politics and my favorite wear yellow garchard stockings. So those things look so stupid of course not just like during the time but even now they look really really stupid and Olivia hates them too because I mean I understand why. <laughs> Olio leaves and he's ready to embarrass himself for love and also let's not kid ourselves for money as well. At that point Maria comes in and the men praise her and they say set thy foot on my neck. So that's the modern day equivalent of step on me because oh my goodness you genius woman how did you come up with this we love you we admire you you're amazing. They all praise her and say that they would marry her and follow her to the gates of hell and they can't wait to see him in yellow stockings. Tis a color she abhors and cross garnered a fashion she detests. She also won't like Malvolio's fake smile. She'll think he's smiling like an idiot because Malvolio is usually like sad and depressed. Sir Toby says that he would follow Maria to the gates of Tartar, thou most excellent devil of wit. And at that point, the act ends. So in Act 3 and Act 4, we will see how that played out. And we will also see the finally all the love triangles coming along. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, on a separate note, do check out, I have a video on Shakespeare, I recently visited his first place because I love Shakespeare, so I hope you enjoyed that video too, and look forward to part two. So do subscribe if you aren't subscribed already so you don't miss part two, turn on your notification bells for everything, and I will see you soon, thank you so much!